Factor Show. The bandwidth for this episode of The Power Factor Show is brought to you by the Firearms Radio Network. Firearmsradio.tv Sponsored by Taylor Freelance, Rainier Ballistics, Hodgson Powders, and JPL Precision. Hey everybody, um, we are going to be doing another episode with Chris Hodgson uh, like we've done in the past um, to basically get your questions uh, and anything that you have on your mind answered. So if you have anything, um, load questions, questions about powder, uh, questions about the industry, questions about Hodgson, stuff like that, uh, go ahead and get the question into us and we will forward it on to Chris and have him uh, hopefully answer it during um, the upcoming episode. So as usual, go ahead and send your questions or anything that's on your mind uh, to powerfactorshow at gmail.com, and we will get this uh, episode done probably here in the next few weeks or so. Thanks. Hey, Power Factor fans, I'm Rick, and I'm back with a little tip for you this time, a little competition tip. If you're an IDPA shooter, you've been an IDPA shooter for very long, you may remember previous re uh, versions of the rule book, uh, one in an earlier version, they used to have a list of approved holsters. And if your holster was not on that list, it wasn't legal for competition. That was replaced by uh, a list of features. Of course, the problem, of course, with having your, your holster has to be on this list. Well, that meant you couldn't make a holster. You couldn't use a holster that was made by a small local holster maker that didn't submit something to headquarters for approval. So you could have two substantially identical holsters as long as one was made by a major maker and it was in the rule book, it was legal, but another one that was identical that was made by somebody who hadn't submitted one for approval, it was illegal. So they changed it all around, got rid of the holster approved holster list and replaced that with a list of, of specifications essentially that indicated what made a holster uh, uh, fulfill the requirements for all day wear for concealed carry and whatnot. And one of the holsters that fell afoul of those rules for years was the famous Uncle Mike's Kydex hip holster. And this was a really popular holster. It cost about 20 bucks, um, you know, even now, or especially now, uh, Kydex holsters from the major makers. If you want to get something exotic from CompTAC or Blade Tech or any of the big name makers, you can easily spend 60, 70, 80, 100 dollars on a Kydex holster. But the Uncle Mike's was always 20 bucks, but the problem was it was banned by name in the rule book. Um, it said that the, the Kydex holster from Uncle Mike's is not legal. Now, the reason why. The last round of rules, before we got into the probe with the three-quarter inch probe, the rules said that you could not have any air between the belt and the holster pouch. Now, as you can see, it, that looks like a good half inch of airspace here between the belt and the holster. And so they just said, this holster is not legal. And um, then, of course, they changed, the, as well as getting rid of the approved holster list, they also said it's okay to alter your holster, make changes to it so that it is legal. Because it used to be, obviously, if your holster was on the approved list and you altered it, that might change its legality. So they said you couldn't change it. But then once the new rules came out that listed the specifications for the holster, um, then you could change it. And, uh, but this holster was still illegal in this form because of this airspace. Well, the trick, if you've got one of these holsters and you still want to use it, even though the airspace rule it, it specifically is no longer in the rule book, we now have the offset rule that if the gun uh, is three quarters of an inch away from, uh, less than three quarters of an inch away um, from the body, your holster is not legal. It's not necessarily a problem with the holster per se. It could be that you weigh 120 pounds and a little bit of offset and the top of the holster is angled out a little bit and you get more than three quarters of an inch. But because you're allowed to alter the holster, a little trick, you heard it here. I didn't make this up, but I heard about it. Take out the two screws, retaining screws, here on the back of the attachment point and that turns it into essentially a paddle. 
you now tuck this part of the holster inside your belt like a paddle and then run the run the belt through here and then that gets rid of that air gap and now the holster is legal so there you go you got your twenty dollar kydex uncle mike's previously illegal now very much legal so as you can see you've got your offset from the belt here you've got your daylight showing in here probably you got your three quarter inch dowel in here i don't have a gun for this because this is i bar i bought this holster for so i could borrow a gun from a buddy but you can see that the holster is quite offset you got all this airspace in here and it's not legal as you can see there's still you still got the daylight here a little bit of daylight but the daylight rule isn't there anymore you've got the paddle tucked inside and now the belt is running just that much closer to your body and of course I stick my three-quarter inch dowel here and we have our three-quarter inch dowel you can see the dowel overhangs the pouch if I had my Glock 20 in here um, it would not be three-quarter inches away from my body it looks like it's more like you know quarter of an inch away from my body so there's your trick tuck that into your pants then run the belt through there and your Uncle Mike's should be legal. Hey everybody, this is Steve. Um, we're going to do a, another segment from the book Break Em All, uh, the complete guide to fixing clay target and shooting problems. Um, real quick, we featured this book earlier on, on one of the other episodes and a lot of people asked us or actually commented to us that the book is about $100 if you try to get it through Amazon, um, book basically being out of print. And that is true. It would be about $100 if you try to get it through Amazon. Um, however, you can get it directly uh, from the author. Uh, I discovered this actually about two months ago, two or three months ago or so, when I was going through my, um, my rehab from surgery. And one of the, the websites that I subscribe to, I get a, a daily email from them uh, called Shotgun Life. And I've mentioned this before, they have a daily tips email that's sent out. And I noticed a lot of the tips that were coming out really hit home. I was looking at them and going, yeah, I can, I can relate to that. And they actually came out of this book. And after looking at, at a lot of these really good tips, I thought, you know, I should probably get this book because um, all these tips that are coming through really seem like they're relevant. Um, and I'd like to learn more, so that's the primary reason why I went out and got it. And I discovered that it was nearly impossible to get until I found the source of it, which is deadtargetschool.com. Those are the guys who actually wrote the book. I contacted them, asked them if they had any more copies left, um, and they said yes, they did have some left. So I don't know how many they have, but if you are interested in getting this book, I would highly recommend doing it sooner rather than later, because later there may not, may not be any copies left other than probably what you can get on Amazon for $100, um, which is way too expensive. But real quick, the one thing I really like about this book is that a lot of books that are out there talk about how to shoot. They talk about the fundamentals. They assume that, you, you know, that you're a beginning shooter, and, and they strive to teach you the techniques and whatnot. This book kind of takes a different approach. It assumes that you know how to shoot, you know the fundamentals, you've possibly you know, been got, gotten through the, the basic shooting part, and now it starts helping you address uh, problems and then coming up with solutions and ways to recognize the problems. So again, the book, uh, the way they talk about problems here, what they do for each of, every one of these problems, they break it down into four different sections. What it really means, how do I know if I'm doing it, how do I stop doing it, and things I can do to prevent it from happening again. So every single section in here, they're going to hit those, those four focal points. The chapter I'm going to talk about today is on aiming. Um, I figured that would probably be something that, that would be of interest to a lot of you, especially those of you who come from a pistol or rifle shooting background, because it's probably the, the biggest problem, the biggest issue that most people who come from that background face when they go into shotgun shooting. So what it really means, this occurs when the shooter is focusing on the front beat of the shotgun and not on the target. That should sound really familiar. The problem is most often found in clay target shooter who is at one time or heavily involved in rifle or pistol shooting. Gee, does this sound familiar or not? Aiming, as the name implies, is a shooter attempting to aim the shotgun at the target as a rifle or pistol shooter would aim at a bullseye. Uh, unfortunately, when a shooter attempts to aim a shotgun at a moving target, they miss, and why is that likely to occur? Well, the problem is, is that in order to shoot a clay pigeon or a clay target, you have to keep the gun moving in sync with the bird. The problem is, is that when you are looking at the bird and you're traveling in sync with it, and then your vision comes back to the barrel, your mind now has no, no 
sense of movement. It doesn't, doesn't know what it's trying to move relative to. So what happens then is that as soon as your vision comes back to the barrel, unless you literally artificially tell yourself to keep moving, the gun will slow down and or stop. Um, and that is basically one of the real signs that a person is aiming. And you'll see this happen when somebody is tracking a target and one of two things will happen is that they, as just before they go to shoot, the gun will literally come down and stop. Or as they're going to shoot, the barrel will be doing this all over the place relative to the bird. And you can then tell immediately that the person is aiming because what they're doing is they're coming back focusing on the bead and trying to put the bead on the bird and get a, a perfect sight picture, which you don't want to do. Um, that's not how shotgunning works. So the problem then in this case here is when, when a person slows the gun down or stops it, what they do then is they miss behind the bird. They're constantly always behind the bird. And it's really frustrating because from their standpoint, you know, people tell them you're behind it, you're behind it, so they think they need to get more in front of it. But in reality, they're stopping the gun and they continue being behind it. It's kind of a, there's no way to really get out of that loop until you recognize what the real issue is. So it says here, clay target shooters are taught to focus on the leading edge of the target, but rifle and pistol shooters are taught to focus on the front sight. Therefore, when a shooter tries to focus on the beat of a shotgun, which often enough is thought as the front sight to a shotgun shooter, instead of focusing on the leading edge of the target, the shooters actually are essentially aiming at the target. So as a result, when the clay target is in the secondary vision, uh, the shooter brings the gun up, and the eye is moving back and forth between the target and the barrel. And that's what you'll notice here, like I mentioned before, is how the, the front of the gun tends to move around um, erratically around the target. Uh, ultimately, the primary focus needs to remain on the front, sorry, on the target and not on the front bead. Uh, the front bead or barrel should be a blur relative to the target. So how do I know if I'm doing it? You can tell in these ways. If you are taking extraordinarily a long time to shoot a target, and if you often are very inconsistently have bad timing, meaning that the point at which the shot is taken varies from target to target. Notice these symptoms are the same problem as riding the target. You've heard us mention before about riding the target or you don't want to ride the target. Riding the target is basically when you mount the gun on the target and you're tracking it, and rather than breaking it in what normally would be the natural spot for that target to be taken, you tend to take it a lot further out along its trajectory. So as an example, in trap shooting, in trap shooting you usually want to shoot the target right as it peaks or right as it crests and flattens out. What you'll see is guys will go and they'll take, it'll go out and flatten out and it'll go further and further and further and then they'll take it as it's usually falling off. That's known as riding the target. In skeet, uh, generally speaking, is that you want to break the bird on your side of the field, meaning before the center stake. Um, in real, I mean, serious skeet shooters, what they'll do is try to break it about two-thirds from the house to the center stake, but basically around by the center stake. If you're taking the target after the center stake, in other words, on the other side of the field or beyond that, then you're effectively riding the target. You're taking too long to, to break the shot. And when you ride the target, the problem is that you're, as the longer you ride it, the more tendency your vision will be to then come back and you know check the lead or check where the barrel is, um, be checked basically. So you want to avoid riding the target at all costs. Um, so it, it says in the case of aiming, you will have a feeling of searching for the target, taking of taking a long time to get the right lead. And under these conditions, the target can be missed anywhere from anywhere around the target, but is most often missed behind because of a slowing gun, as we mentioned before. Uh, you may not be aware of this as you are not looking at the target, but rather actually looking at the gun barrel. Uh, it recommends here that you actually, if you can, to, to recognize that you may be doing this, is either maybe videotape yourself and look for a slowing gun or have somebody else watch you. Now, like I've mentioned, it's really obvious to people watching you when you're doing this because the gun will be tracking along and all of a sudden slow down and stop. Or what will more often happen is that you'll see the front uh, muzzle try to track the bird uh, rather than being smooth. So how do I stop doing it? You need to change your focus away from the gun barrel and or bead into the leading edge of the target. This can be done by using a combination of two methods. 
Rifle or pistol shooters experience will cause, sorry, rifle or pistol shooting experience will cause a shooter to aim at the target by seeking that exact relationship between the target and sight. So this, you know, we, we have this problem in pistol shooting and rifle shooting is you're always trying to get the perfect sight picture. You, you delay breaking the shot until you have that perfect sight picture and unfortunately you, you can't you know, translate that into shot getting. Your mind will tell you when the right time is to break the target. But for those of you who do come back and look at the bead, what they recommend here is that you remove the front bead from the shotgun. Now, that, in my opinion, is a little bit aggressive in terms of trying to correct the problem. Um, sometimes guys will use actually sight black, or sometimes they'll use like tape or something like that over the bead. But removing it to me seems like, I mean, I, I've heard of people removing beads from shotguns and stuff like that. Um, but before going and doing that, I would probably recommend a little less permanent solution. Yes, if you remove it, you can probably put it back in. My concern about removing it would be that if the threads are tight or whatever, you end up snapping the bead off the gun, or when you try to go put it back in, that you end up cross-threading it or something like that. So I, I would, rather than taking the bead off, I would recommend um, just masking it out. The other technique that they recommend here is practicing at home with an unloaded shotgun. And their method is actually rather interesting. Before I talked about um, the dry fire practice I did at home, uh, during my surgery rehab, and I, I used what was called the, the OSP three bullet drill, where you have effectively three targets. They're not necessarily bullets. They can be tennis balls or whatever. Um, but the idea is that you are mounting the gun in front of the, of the target that you're looking at. Um, and the idea there is to get you comfortable with, with looking either down the side of the gun or across the top of the gun be it a left to right or right to left target, but the idea is that you're not looking straight down the gun at the target. So what their recommendation here is is that you should pick a spot on the wall as your target and then mount and point the shotgun at a location away from that spot. So far, so good. Keeping the eyes focused on the target, bring the barrel to where the eyes are looking, that is, at the spot. You should start the gun in a different location on the wall, always moving to the same target spot. When doing this exercise, you need to pay attention to the times the eyes will go back to the barrel and or bead. If this is occurring, you need to reinforce, reinforce that the focus is on the target spot away from the gun barrel or bead. My only issue with this recommendation is that what I'd be afraid of and what I saw before is that when I start bringing the gun into my line of vision, in other words, what they're recommending, recommending is that you look at a spot and bring the gun to it. But as, when you bring that gun into the picture of where that spot is, what I'd be afraid of is that the vision will then come back and try to check the alignment of the gun um, beads, front middle bead if you have a middle bead, but especially the, the alignment of the front bead to the target. The problem doing that is that it reinforces that bring the vision back when you get close to a target so that what I'm afraid is that when you go out and actually start shooting real targets that you may be inclined to bring the gun to or you know toward the target and then come back and look at the beat again. So that's why I like the three bullet drill where you're actually never actually you know looking at the barrels um, or at the beat at all. You, you focus on the target and you have faith in your subconscious that it, your subconscious will put the gun where it needs to be um, in front of the target uh, for a crossing target. So things I can do to prevent it from happening again. When you practice, you need to practice focusing on the leading edge of the target. A good way to practice is to watch other shooters' targets when you're not shooting. By watching other people's targets and practicing focusing your eyes on the leading edge of these targets, the eyes will become better trained to do this automatically. And I found myself even doing that uh, when I've been out shooting either um, trap or if I'm shooting skeet or especially sporting clays as I, I watch the bird travel um, and, and really, you know, get my vision into tune of actually looking at either the top of the dome or the leading edge, um, depending on the target presentation. So, um, you know, those birds are effectively free to you. You might as well let your vision do something while you're not shooting and, um, and, and help basically get your eyes in tune with actually looking and tracking the uh, targets. And it also actually helps you le learn the lines of the target too. Uh, especially in, in skeet and or sporting clays, not so much in trap, because in trap you don't know where your bird's going to go. So. so if you have any questions, uh, send us an email at powerfactorshow.com, and I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks.
Bum, 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 bum,